Hi, I'm Alison Burrell. Welcome to Radiation Research Society's podcast. I'm here, here with uh, Sylvia Formenti, um, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming with us to, to have this discussion. Um, I'm very excited to, to discuss your research with you. Yes. Um, I know that you are now working at Cornell Medical School, yes. um, and are, has your research stayed the same now that you've moved your lab over? Yes, um, they, we continue to do the same. We were very lucky to receive a lot of uh, endorsement of the line of research we're doing at Cornell, where there is a tradition of uh, uh, strong immunology. Mm -hmm. um, and the dean is a very famous immunologist. Uh, the actually dean of science is an immunologist. And um, so, and they are, um, you know, we're surrounded by fantastic labs doing immunology research, so it's, we're very well poised now. And I was lucky to uh, bring with me Sandra De Maria, who's been my collaborator for many years. And um, it, well, I think you interviewed before. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, yes actually last year there's, right. there's another right. vodcast with Sandra yes. discussing. And, and this year Sandra research. got the mentorship award from the Radiation Research Society. So Congratulations. A, yes, she's a fantastic mentor. And she has mentored me, believe it or not, because I'm certainly not an immunologist. But I, I got fascinated um, at, the, at the idea of combining uh, my knowledge of ionizing radiation and radiation biology with um, an, a better understanding of the immune system. And we are at a fantastic phase in the history of uh, uh, cancer immunology because a lot of uh, the research of the past 20, 30 years is coming to fruition and finally being available to treat patients. So, you know, there, there are ways to target some of these pathways that now got elucidated that may impact, actually they have started to impact on patient survival. And one thing I want to stress mm -hmm. is that, um, you know, th there is nothing as personalized as a functioning immune system that is uh, incredibly individualized, so it is personalized medicine, and recovering those capacities of the immune system is a part of personalized medicine or in personalized oncology. But I also want to stress that when the immune system learns how to reject and establish cancer, it acquires a memory that does not require continuous treatment. So then the job is done by the immune system. And this is a difference compared to the use of some of the targeted therapies that come from personalized medicine that have um, made a big difference in individual patients, but they require continuous treatment with the same drug. Instead, you know, if you're capable to immunize the patient against his or her own tumor, and even in a metastatic setting, once they learn how to reject the tumor, it's for life. So you have patients who have brain metastasis being in complete remission without any other treatment for many years. So your lab focuses on the combination of radiation therapy and immunotherapy. Yes. Well, well over the, the years, we, we really um, looked at more at um, what was the impact of ionizing radiation on the immune system? How, um, what are the positive effects of, of ionizing radiation? And what are the negative effects? There is a bit of both. And then in collaboration with Sandra De Maria, really we focus on how to switch the balance in favor of the positive effects. And sometimes it means removing a break, and other times it means using an agonist to help the positive effect of radiotherapy. So for instance, an example of using an agonist to help the positive effect of radiotherapy is to combine radiotherapy with toll-like receptor agonists. Um, one way to uh, remove a break is to use anti-CTLA-4, not only because tumors have this uh, you know, uh, barrier of uh, you know, enhanced regulatory T cells and, and other cells and anti uh, this, you know, uh, with CTLA-4 blockade you could remove, but also radiation induces regulatory T cells. So it is particularly interesting to combine it with anti-CTLA-4. So radiation is a mixed um, tool that has pro-immunogenic and also immune suppressive effects. Now your lab focuses on breast cancer? Or do you well, we've done a bit this? of uh, different tumors. So we, one of, we've done some brain tumors originally where we showed that radiation induces MHC, MHC class one. Um, in, col in collaboration with Elizabeth Newcomb many years ago, 
and then we did a lot of breast cancer because we're fortunate to have a lot of received uh, consistent funding in breast cancer research of radiation and immunotherapy. And uh, um, more recently, we moved into lung cancer just because uh, of the promise of combining anti ctla 4 with radiotherapy in osmocell cell lung cancer. And that is, I think, is a very interesting model of a drug that in osmocell cell lung cancer, blocking ctla 4 didn't really give a, a very strong signal just with the use of the pharmacological treatment, ipilimumab or tremalimumab. Um, so it's fascinating that when you, however, when you combine it with radio, radiotherapy, you start seeing the signal, you start seeing responses. And now the, the challenge is really to understand who are the patients who respond and why others don't respond. And the mechanism of resistance to the combination of radiotherapy, and for instance, immune checkpoint blockage, but could be generalized, is often complicated, complex, and individualized. So for some patients, maybe induction of pdl one For other patients, could be other mechanisms. So I think uh, once you, you establish that there is no response to a combination of radiotherapy, immunotherapy, the challenge is to understand the individual barriers. And then, fortunately, it may require for biopsies and, and more invasive uh, investigations on the individual patients and then try to overcome those. So your lab is conducting clinical trials currently? So the, where it's interesting, where we're uh, designing is a bit of a mix. It, you know, I would say that most of the lab work is really in the hands of, of uh, Sandra De Maria and now more recently a junior faculty who is an MD PhD and Kuze Golden. Mm -hmm. And they are focused on looking at mechanisms as well as designing mouse clinical trials that, that enable us to learn preclinically what, what is, we should expect in the clinic. And interestingly enough, with some exceptions, those preclinical studies have been very predictive of what, what is going on in the clinic. So they represent a, an interesting space um, to, to test, you know, just for, before offering patients these options. I have to say that now with more accessible immunotherapy drugs, it's definitely easier to go directly to the patients before proving evidence uh, preclinically. But when we started, there were really no drugs to investigate. So the very first proof of principle trial, as we just recently published the results in the Lancet Oncology, was combining radiotherapy with a very common growth factor called GMCSF that was available, it, it was approved for, you know, kind of correcting um, bone marrow suppression after chemotherapy and so on. So we could apply for a different role in our uh, design was to potentiate cross priming and uh, recruitment of dendritic cells and function of dendritic cells. After we applied radiation to a metastasis of uh, heavily pretreated metastatic um, cancer patients with multiple malignancies, but with many metastases and resistant to treatment, at least uh, one line of treatment, and on the average on that study of 40 patients, 41 patients was an average of three or four. So what we were able to show is that, I in fact, if you um, help recruiting the dendritic cells, so you in increase the process of cross-presentation of antigens that are released by radiotherapy during the cytocidal effect of radiotherapy. So when you apply radiotherapy, it kills cells. Mm -hmm. And what are the fragments of those cells or new antigens induced by radiotherapy on just existing epitopes that are just overexpressed after radiotherapy? As part of the stress response, if you have now more dendritic cells and, and a more functional dendritic cells doing cross presentations to T cells, you are more likely to um, offer an opportunity for, for the patients to immunize against his or her own tumor. And in fact, in uh, a 27 percent of, of these heavily pretreated patients, we saw a response outside the field. So we saw that they will have reduction objective response of a metastasis that was not in the radiation field. And it's a proof of principle just to show that approximately in a third of patients, just by potentiating cross-priming radiation can then um, help the immune system 
to fight the cancer. And this is just by adding this growth factor yes, to the radiation that. therapy. Yes, is there any other drugs that these patients are receiving? Well, some of these patients were kept on the same chemotherapy. Some were not receiving any chemotherapy, but they had to have progressed mm -hmm. to the previous chemotherapy. We kept them on the same chemo because sometimes they had mixed responses. But consistently, we saw lesions that were not responding under chemotherapy. We didn't change any other systemic treatment or just radiation and, and GMCSF, and then suddenly response outside the field. And uh, that was pretty impressive. And then when we was not a, uh, one of the objective of the studies, but we had exploratory objectives to try to understand a marker for responders from non-responders. And we learned that the ones who had enough lymphocytes, so the ratio of neutrophils to lymphocytes was um, less than four, so in favor of sufficient lymphocytes, mm -hmm. those patients were more likely to have a response. So if you, you need to have a little bit of immune competence even down the line in metastatic disease. And then just by potentiating cross-priming, you start seeing responses outside the radiation field. So so-called upscope of responses, up yes. Um, do you think that this would work on patients before they've developed metastatic disease? Certainly, and it would be a much more interesting uh, group to study. And, um, you know, it's very difficult because, of course, we uh, um, cannot challenge existing paradigms that, that w do work, mm -hmm. or at least partially do work, mm -hmm. because we cannot promise that what we offer is better. But I, I would be very tempted to, in fact, try to immunize against the tumor before removing the tumor with surgery. So if we could find models where you, we can irradiate and uh, combine some immunotherapy, remove some breaks to, from the immune system, and then do the surgery. The advantage could be that in tumors who, that we know are already are highly metastatic. So we know when we remove the primary, there's already micrometastasis, like node positive breast cancer, mm -hmm. uh, local advanced nosmocellan cell lung cancer, um, uh, nodal positive melanoma or deep uh, uh, lesions of melanoma. So if we could irradiate and give um, some kind of immune enhancing therapy, maybe we can immunize against that specific tumor and now the patients will, ha will have a memory, an immune memory, mm -hmm. that if the metastases are similar to the original tumor, when they start regrowing, is now poised to stop the metastatic spread. That would be very exciting yeah, to see. <laughs> I hope to see that in the yes. future. <laughs> Um, so this is the in-situ vaccine that you are going to be yes. talking about at yes. the plenary speech. So tomorrow I'm trying to uh, go over all the steps to ac achieve a successful um, in-situ vaccination. And, uh, you know, the mechanism of immune rejection of tumors is complicated as many steps. And um, for the time tumors are established, clearly it has failed. Otherwise, it wouldn't be established. And um, I would try to focus on how, you know, we have already in preclinically and clinically evidence that removing some of or correcting some of the mistakes in that cycle of rejection may result into uh, modifying the outcome of patients. So some dramatic responses and with the help of radiation completely outside the field that you wouldn't see just with immunotherapy alone. So. Um, if we had an immunotherapy that works uh, by itself, it wouldn't be necessary to use radiation. But radiation has a lot of advantages, including that of creating enough of a um, stress response and an inflammatory response in tumors to recruit the immune system, to get the attention of the immune system to, to the tumors, and maybe convert lymphocytic poor tumors into lymphocytic rich tumors. So you were saying, um, to, to take a step back, that only one-third of these patients response. were respons yeah. responding to this. Do you have any theories as to why only a third of the patients responded versus... That's COVID? why we look at this ratio of, of neutrophils oh. over lymphocytes. And, and there was an association of responders with a better ratio, which is intuitive because they, you know, somehow they have enough um, cells and they are equipped and probably that ratio is, you know, has been studied by many others and seems to be an indicator in metastatic disease of prognosis, meaning that if the ratio of neutrophils over lymphocytes is more than four, those patients are more likely to have a, you know, a closer time to death. So they're the beginning of a cachectic kind of mm -hmm. uh, demise. And, and the 
question is, maybe that is a useful way to select patients before entering them into trials because it may be too late for some patients to mount an immune response. We know for sure that um, older people have more difficulties being immunized against viruses or mm -hmm. uh, a, a, the flu vaccine. Or ver so the idea is, maybe independently from age, the, there is a phase in, in the immune decay of the immune system during cancer where there may be a point of no return, and now you cannot rescue them back mm -hmm. to fight their tumor. But there are there any biomarkers that, that tell you at what point somebody's immune system yeah. is at? So, so far, the main biomarker we found was this ratio of neutrophils over uh, lymphocytes, but I'm sure there are proofs, like you can do even proofs of energy by doing skin tests and so on, that we didn't analyze. That, mm -hmm. that proof of principle trial was with no immune monitoring. Now, I, I think we're going, there are a lot of studies combining immunotherapy with radiation, and we're going to learn a lot from those. Also, we're going to learn from our mistakes. So, you know, may, we may uh, target the wrong barrier or not target enough barriers to uh, an immune response to radiotherapy. Okay. Um, this might be completely off topic, yes. but um, I know at the NIH they're doing trials with immunotherapy where um, where they're completely, well, they're taking lymphocytes, um, uh, T cells from patients and re-engineering them. Right. Yeah, cars, but also, um, I think there's they another lab. The lymphocytes. Yeah, yeah, where they expand right. them and then re-inject them to the patient, well, first ablating their immune system and then right. re-injecting. Would that be something where you, you could combine what you're doing with, with so, this? <laughs> so or do you think that, I mean, there's also, a lot of controversy with that because it's a very expensive and long process right. and very right. time dependent. Right. So um, some of the use of cars or s the strategies of uh, very elegant strategy of Steve Rosenberg of, Rosenberg yes, of. of expanding the population of lympho specific lymphocytes, tumor specific lymphocytes have um, delivered incredible success in selected patients and as you pointed out, they're very expensive. So I'm not so clear um, radiation in the way we have been testing it can be combined with that. One appeal of radiation is that while it would be really nice to uh, establish the neoantigens or whatever is uh, the shift from not being um, antigenically um, uh, evoking an immune response of pretreatment tumors, then we radiate them and then become a source of neoantigen or somehow they immunize the patient against not only the primary tumor but outside the radiation field, it would be really nice to pin down the, the precise mechanism by identifying the neoantigens. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be um, important to establish from a mechanism point of view, but then once we have the mechanism, it's really not necessary to know the specific antigens because in theory, if you were to figure out the correct cocktail of immune interventions to do around radiotherapy, you could just count on the immune system selecting the correct epitopes to mount an immune response. And you know, as you can imagine, is we have selected uh, in, through evolution with the strength of our immune system. Mm -hmm. So the immune system can do a magnificent job in, in figuring out once it's recovered from the kind of acquired blindness it, it has with established tumors. So once we fix the immune system of uh, um, the cancer patient, then you know, somehow releasing these neoantigens from the tumor. And we talk about ionizing radiation, but there could be different mechanisms for releasing antigens, so not necessarily ionizing radiation. But you have enough of an inflammatory response in the tumor to have a tumor-specific response from the immune system. And once that occurs, the advantage is that it can be individualized, so each patient could have its, his or her own immune response, and you don't really need to know exactly the epitopes because it, it has to work in that patient. Mm -hmm. And that takes into consideration the normal heterogeneity of tumors across individuals, and in theory, even within the same individual, because you, you, if you're lucky, you have representation of the different subclones in the tumor. And then, um, the other advantage of using ionizing radiation, for instance, is that, of course, is a modality we all know and, and we have a lot of experience with. 
So if you uh, use it with drugs, for instance, that have toxicities to the bowel versus the lung and so on, we, have, we know so much about the toxicity of radiation, we can avoid to, com to accumulate the toxicity. So maybe if a drug has a toxicity to the bowel, you will select a metastasis that is not close to the bowel to irradiate. So you don't have to overlap toxicities. And then finally, if, you know, in theory, you could put people into remission and let's say, after dormancy, a metastasis restarts, possibly because it was different from the original tumor. So there was somehow through genomic instability has acquired different properties or started different. And you could reinduce it, so you could irradiate again. So there are a lot of, of advantages of converging a modality we're very familiar with in the long-term management of cancer. Do you think there's anything like autoimmunity that's getting in the way or some other processes like that could be an explanation why it's only working on some patients that, that you could exploit to, you know, maybe suppress something else that is getting in the way? So um, one issue we have not covered is um, what is the genetic background of the carrier. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that uh, the way we see that with the same tumor characteristics, some patients do very well and other patients do very poorly with the same treatment. It is possible that when, when we use uh, you know, specific uh, cytocidal agents, whether it's chemo or radiotherapy, if there is a contribution of the immune system, meaning if there is a recruitment of the immune system in getting a, uh, the final response, maybe polymorphisms and you know, SNPs in the mm -hmm. pathways of the immune system so this field of immune genomics mm. could justify why some people harness better from a point of view of the immune system, cell death, and others don't. And there is some preliminary data suggesting this is the case, for instance, for toll-like receptor 4, that is uh, um, a, an important signal for uh, dendritic cell activation and cross-priming, that, um, you know, when comparing, uh, it was published by the group Gustave Roussy, uh, Laurent Zitzvogel, and Guido Cromer, that when you revisit a large cohort of uh, patients with metastatic, with uh, node positive, sorry, met breast cancer, treated with classical uh, chemotherapy, just by analyzing that SNP, that specific polymorphism, you can divide their outcome. So the way we handle the um, response to chemotherapy may also depend on who we are from a genetic background, including an immune genomic background. Mm -hmm. And that would definitely take us more in the direction of precision or personalized absolutely. medicine. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to see more research that comes yes, from your lab in the future. So <laughs> and uh, I hope to see you next year thank at you. <laughs> the conference. Much, yes. Thank you for participating in the, in the yes. podcast. And I want to say another thing. Yeah, I'm, sure. I'm very pleased by the fact that compared to I don't know, seven, eight, uh, ten years ago, uh, the society is accommodating a lot. And I see many talks that among the many effects of ionized radiation, they started listing this effect on the immune system. Mm -hmm. So I think that for radiation research to have um, uh, somehow welcomed this new area of research is, is very exciting and speaks highly about the society. Yeah. And also, it, it has given the opportunity um, for uh, radiation biology in general and radiation physics to um, connect with new disciplines like Im immunology and, and not necessarily just cancer immunology but immunology in, in general because the, as you know much of uh, radiation biology concerns normal tissue. So the way we're looking at the microbiome which is also part of uh, as a lot of crosstalk with the immune system is we're looking at the immune system as a, a big player in the radiation response. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I, I'm seeing more immunology yeah, all related over the, the um, program, radiation yes. research. Yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, very good. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. For My coming. pleasure. <laughs> Thank you.